Welcome to the DIY Writer Show with the mild-mannered, slightly heroic host, Jeff Bacon. This is Jeff Bacon with the DIY Writer Podcast, and today I have Eric Shapiro with me. He's an author, he's a filmmaker, and he also owns a newspaper, which is really cool. And we're going to get into all of it in just a minute, but Eric, how the hell are you doing today? Oh, pretty good. Thank you for having me. Good. Thank you for the nice intro. Oh, well, you know, I, I try and be nice. <laughs> yeah, That might change. Who knows? <laughs> um, so you have a book that you want to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Red so it's my Dennis. first novel. Yeah, it's called yeah? Red Dennis. Yeah. What's interesting is I've been around for a while. I've been a writer for a long time. I, I made my living as a ghostwriter for like 18 years. Okay. And, you know, speech writing, you know, doing editing, script doctoring, client, that sort of stuff. So I was always stealing time to do my own writing, which was usually novellas or screenplays, because like I would be able to steal like two weeks a year and, you know, like, okay, I can do a personal project and I'd be able to draft a novella or, you know, 25,000 words or whatnot. And this is actually my first novel because uh, three years ago, my wife was actually the founder of our local newspaper. She brought me on board to help her run it and it's grown, it's grown into a viable business. So it finally actually gave me room because write, we write a lot of news, but it's more sprinting than marathons. Like sure. I finally had room in my schedule for a personal project. So mm -hmm. it was this. So my novel, uh, Red Dennis. So it's a, a thriller and it's uh, put out by a publisher in Italy called Independent Legions. And part of why I had to go to Italy relates to the subject matter of the book, which is a little infla potentially inflammatory. Like, you know, but, but it's interesting when you do that sort of quote unquote shocking content. What yeah. I've generally found out is that people are down to earth about it you off more often than not they meet you halfway because they're like oh yeah i've had those dark thoughts too like it's not <laughs> it's nothing it's nothing outlandish like yeah so we're um, totally opposed to dark thoughts here Just yeah absolutely. yeah that's, that's where you draw the line yeah. yeah that's where i draw the line no no murder no nothing like that it's all, it's yeah, all yeah. this is all pg-12 you got it yeah, yeah right. pg-12 yeah. yeah you know just under 13 <laughs> yeah anyway. right uh so um, you know shock me tell me about your book man um, yeah, so it's like, you remember, you and I, I'm, I'm gathering you and I are probably of a similar age or generation. You remember the movie Falling Down with Michael Douglas? No, he just I goes, love that movie. You oh, know, I hated so that good. movie I, when I first saw it. Okay, yeah. And now I relate. And it's like. Oh, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's taboo to say you relate. Like, a couple times on social media, I've shared the uh, the character. You know, I guess his name is Defense. And he, he has, like, yeah. a machine gun. I'm like, wait a second. That actually is really the wrong message right now like people <laughs> people are gonna think i'm gonna i'm like a murderer but it was a really iconic movie like so i'd say red dennis comes out of that vein it's like falling down taxi driver but it's the backdrop is the me too movement that was that was why it was hard to get a uh an american publisher because they're like sure. whoa well even that term alone sets people on edge you know like less now than then like it was uh I wrote it in 2019. It's actually set in 2018, consciously. Because okay. I, you know, the fever was so high with uh, Me Too, cancel culture right at that moment that I was like, all right, I'm actually going to timestamp this. So like the first page of the book says, this is a story that takes place in 2018. I'm like, I'm going to, sure. I'm going to actually date this, which could be detrimental, but I'm like, this, we're in such a crazed moment in history with Trump and cancel culture and Twitter. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm actually going to say this is a time capsule. So basically, the character Dennis um, gets in a small town. Um, sort of quasi me too scenario where he says the wrong thing and it's kind of creepy he doesn't really mean anything by it but it escalates to the point where uh, the woman to whom he said it says you know she was worried he was going to rape her and it really like it, he becomes radicalized and marginalized and, and really alienated and he turns to violence like he's just okay. uh so it's just it's all about radicalization in the sense like the whole idea that uh like you and i were talking about before the podcast started like if you're in a tribalism frame of mind and you try and lecture your opposition or like re reform your opposition like this is the way you must think and act these yeah. are the rules you have to follow i think human nature i think i i i i kind of suspect more times than not human nature is gonna react in, in in the opposite way so if you want somebody to be like these are the politically correct ideas you have to abide by I think the person's going to be like, no, I actually think you're a fucking asshole and I hate you. And now I hate everybody like you. So that's right. kind of what, what, what the process is in the book. It's yeah. that mob mentality. You got it. You said it. Yeah, exactly. And it's, uh, it's interesting having run a paper because we're in a city, it's a city of 80,000 people. So it's not like a small town. It's not like a, you know, like a one horse town sort of thing, but right. it's small, you know, it's like people yeah. know each other and, and, um, 
running the newspaper sort of gave me the backdrop. Like, uh, mm-hmm. and I never had any sort of experience like the character has, but it, it really acclimated me to how the politics in a small town work. And the, the, the character is a small business owner. He happens to be running for city council when the book starts. Okay. So it's just like, I, because I follow our city council day <clears> by day, and I'm always aware of what they're doing as part of my job, just the local journalism, I'm like really aware of the dynamics in terms of like, oh, if this person you know, speaks out of turn, maybe they're going to be out of fashion now for six months. So like, you know, it's like the tide's going to go against them. It's interesting to see the political wind shift. And, and so I was able to sort of bring that into the novel too. Sure. So then you also have the political pressures there where, you know, he accidentally says something wrong. Somebody says, Oh my God, I was so threatened by, you know, the, yeah, it's terrifying. Yeah. 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 It's interesting because even go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, and then it gets spun up, I assume. Yeah, yeah, precisely. It just it keeps escalating. And like, it, it, you know, he's a control freak. I'm not saying he's a good guy. Like I might've made him sound like he's grounded. He's actually narcissistic. So he's like the type that if you press the entitlement button, he's like the type that'll spin out of control. Like, but he's never been pushed this far before. So like, you know, so it just escalates. Yeah. So it was, uh, it, it was personal too, because I think as guys, when that stuff was coming down, I mean, I assume any person of conscience was, you know, thought it was it was a good thing in terms of the Me Too movement to you know uh, push back against misconduct and harassment and assault and abuse. Like it's all consciousness that's long overdue to come to the fore. But then it's also horrifying that uh, you know you can be tagged in a post and, and accused of something. And and because I was coming at it from that side of things, which is politically incorrect, you know, publishing it in and of itself is a little taboo. But yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, it, yeah. it's fiction. It's a reflection of what the hell's going on now or what, you said what was going on a little bit ago. And, you know, the, the problem with, <clears throat> in my opinion, with this um, environment that we have where everybody gets offended about everything and you yeah. have to do this and you have to do that. And they just, they, yeah. they stomp off, you know, number one, no, there's no reason to be offended. If somebody yeah. says something that you don't agree with, the only person that that controls whether or not you're offended is you. And if you get it's, so, it's so true. Yeah. I mean, I got to tell you, I think the only way I always audit myself in this regard, I'm like, sometimes I'm like, wait, have I ever even been offended? Like, I think like, have you ever, do you know a movie called uh, Salo, Se- 120 Days of Sodom? Do you know that? It's like no. a really extreme horror movie. It's like an Italian, it's funny because it happens to be Italian too. It's an Italian <laughs> horror movie from the seventies. And um it's it's like extremely shocking like it's like stuff with like it's utterly disgusting like i was nauseous after i watched it okay um but i i asked myself like even something like that did did it offend me i'd I'd have to say no i think the only way you can offend me is by insulting my children or or my wife like i think you know that this is personally offensive i'm like okay i'm offended and i would feel the need to protect my own and i think that's a sort of biological instinct but um offended by like something somebody said like it almost like i can't like i almost don't get it like it's like it, i can understand being bothered or feel affronted or feel like the person's ignorant but offended to the point where there has to be like a uh, like a um like some sort of blowback or, or, or mm-hmm. justice administered it i think is absurd i i i feel no need unless i actually know the person and actually care mm-hmm. about them to try and correct anything yeah, you know, I mean, realistically, that's, and if it's somebody I care about, yeah, then I'll have a debate with them. I'll, I'll have a discussion, but I'll still, you know, love them, like them, whatever. After I get done with it, it's just, you know, I want to know where you're coming from. Yeah, absolutely, and that's sort of the libertarian mentality in terms of live and let live, don't tread on me. It's like there really is a very eternal question as to whether or not you can change somebody, and you certainly can't do it. You certainly can't do it like with a tweet or with like a strong, forceful paragraph lodged to them. You're just going to, you know, aff- you know, affront them. And just like, it, I think there is, if you're going to change them at all, the risk is the opposite of the intended risk. And it, like I said, it becomes radicalization. So in other words, yeah. if you're like a, like a holier than thou, you know, woke progressive on social media and you're shaming somebody for what they did or said, that person's going to like suddenly feel sus- suspicious about everybody of your strike. And then mm-hmm. you actually just converted them to your opponent and it's a shame to see this go on so often because uh, I feel that with the far left, like they don't understand their opponent and they just like, they think they're fighting a war, but like an effective war, but it's actually, they're all just talking in, inside an echo chamber. So it's, you know, all this stuff is maddening. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the right's the same way. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. I'm, I mean, because I'm not of it. Like I don't see it as much, but go ahead. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you just even watch the comments that come out of the Senate, you know, um, yeah. Some of those guys, it's like, have you ever 
in your life had to fucking struggle for anything? You know, you've been there for 30 years and you say, okay, this year we're going to do something good. Why the fuck would I ever believe you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It's all all a hustle. Yeah. Yeah. It's all just just a a racket. It's all just talk. It's all just bullshit. I'm both sides. It really is. And we're stuck. Like nothing ever. It's what my, my dear friend, Rich, we're always talking about this. Like we'll have political discussions. We'll go like to all ends of the earth, but ultimately his capper is usually like, and, and nothing ever changes. That's right. the whole thing. Like, like the government just doesn't work as an instrument and it hasn't for like a generation or two, like Congress doesn't work. It's just like, and we get so inflamed, like having to win elections. Like it's just, it's ridiculous. The whole mindset is poisonous. Like you, people don't understand. Like if I vote on the left, like if I support like Bernie Sanders, all I'm doing is, and I, I, I like Bernie Sanders, right? Like, and I have a libertarian streak. I can get, you know, it's like left libertarian, but I can understand the appeal of different sides. But the thing is in voting for him, I'm not eliminating the anti-government right-wing sentiment from the spectrum. All I'm doing is putting my thumb on one side of the scale to be like, all right, let's, let's widen the debate over here, cancel student debt, deal with climate change, like, like bring in some possibilities but but I still want the fervent left right debate, you know, because theoretically that's how democracy is supposed to work, even though it, it it doesn't manage to work lately. So in theory, and this this just seems to be in theory at this point, yeah. you know, if you have somebody that's on the right and somebody on the left, and they fight and they negotiate and you get somewhere yeah. in the middle, that's probably a really good solution for the entire nation. I it, absolutely, and it, it did. You know, I mean. I wasn't politically conscious during a time, like I've been, I'm 42 now. I've probably been politically conscious in terms of watching like federal politics since I was like 23, like in in a way that was, wasn't casual. And I don't think I've ever seen it really work that way. Like it's, it's pretty much starting with George W. Bush. They didn't let Obama do anything like, you know, Trump is just a whole other phenomenon, which is insane. And then, yeah, it's, um, yeah. so I, I've just never seen, at the local level, I see it. So that's heartening. It actually is very sobering and it cultivates sanity for me to be so involved locally because I see them do it. You know, you got Democrats, Republicans, and they work it out. And mm-hmm. a lot of times they want to team up on initiatives with their opposition because they know, like you said, they'll get the best politically scientific solution out if they hash it out together. Right. Um, they'll just cover all their constituents. But at the federal level, I think everything is fucked. I agree. I agree. Yeah. And I think, I think it really comes down to anybody that's been there for 30 years needs to get the hell out. Oh, I agree. Yeah. I mean, and that's, I mean, and wasn't that always like the point of the founders, like with term limits, like, but we have all these senators, they're just lifelong. Yeah. And I don't yeah. get it. Even, even uh, the uh, house of representatives. I mean, there's a lot of people that are yeah. lawyers in there. It's like, you know what? <sighs> Nothing's happened. You've been yeah. in control. You've been out of control. You know, you, you've been in the majority, yeah. out of the majority, and it's still the same shit every day. You yeah, know? and that's where I, I couldn't agree more. And that's where, like, there is a lot to be said for the free market mentality, because when you operate professionally in a free market, you're incentivized by money. But when, you're, when, you're, when your income comes from the government, when you're on the teat, so to speak, and you're a bureaucrat, you're kind of incentivized to not rock the boat. Like that's what happens psychologically. Like you just won't need your steadiness. So basically your job becomes getting the vote in every two or four years to keep you there. But if you do anything too drastic or extreme, and we've seen that on the local level too, like you know, uh, in terms of abstentions, people will just abstain, abstain, abstain because they don't want to ever make a choice right. because then they're going to alienate big parts of the voting block. And if they, yep. they swing too wide, they might, you know, have a moment of exhilaration or create actual change, but their political career could end. So the whole, all these contradictions are like a to- toxicity in the system. I, I totally agree. I, yeah. I yearn for politicians that actually have opinions and stick up for yeah. themselves and can Absolutely. do that for more than a year. Yeah. Oh my God. And it takes, I mean, I, I got to tell you, I yearn for it too, number one. And number two, I probably couldn't do it. I'd be too, it would be too like traumatic, nerve wracking. Like it's hard. I mean, you have people uh, brutally bashing you from the opposite side, telling you everything you believe is wrong, ripping your character apart. I mean, you have to be legitimately tough to actually do oh, yeah. the job well. Like you have to be like Lyndon Johnson level of like, <laughs> you know, a, like a political operator. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that just, I don't think that exists anymore. I really, I, I hate to say it, but I feel that way too. Yeah. So it's, I, as idealistic as I can get, like I, I want, I want, you know, Biden to be the one, but it's just like, it's become so corporatized. The whole thing is so bought and sold. Uh, it's hard not to be cynical about it. it. It's hard. You know, when you hear about the, uh, the amounts of money that travel between uh, lobbyists and politicians yeah. in general, and then you look at what they're getting paid in the Senate and what their net worth is. It's really hard to trust them with anything. 
Oh, you, you, know. you said it. I mean, it's just like, yeah, they're just for sale. I mean, they're open for business. Right. You know, I yeah, was it yeah. Robin Williams that said every politician should wear a coat just like NASCAR so they have the patches so they know what yeah, they represent. It, it, oh, exactly. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 that legitimately, and even though it's a, like, you know, it's a brilliant piece of comedy, that's actually not a bad idea. I mean, it's like you, we actually would see what was going on. Right. And there'd be no uh, obfuscation, like lie that just, yeah. Oh, I know why he's passing this. Look at all the pharmaceutical patches. You know? Right, exactly. That's it. Yeah, yeah. it has nothing to do ah. with Democrat, Republican. The other thing is, like, in terms of incentives, when their careers are over, they go on to books, spe- you know, speech appearances, yep. you know, academic jobs. It's very, very cushy. So it's a very self-interested trajectory to get on to. I think if you make it two, yeah. two terms, I think you've got it made for life. Oh, that's it. Yeah, absolutely. Otherwise, you're going to be a lobbyist because you know how it works. Or you, I mean, you're going to yeah. be slid into something that's nice cushy and you're going to make a lot of money yeah you're just fed fed into the system at that point i remember like the only time i was charged with a crime was uh it was uh 2007 it was like it was like a a, a, um traffic related thing i was uh i my license had been suspended i didn't know it and i was pulled over and i was charged with a misdemeanor and it was a whole thing and um i mean just told oh my god i just totally went back there and lost my train of thought what was the thing you said just before i got on this yeah. that's cool go on that's all uh, right yeah uh, wait a second oh it was um it's the oh that's right feeding into the system i remember so i got a lawyer i had to pay quite a bit of money because it was yeah. uh it realistically in retrospect it wasn't any serious like i wasn't now i know better like i wasn't really looking at jail time i had no criminal record but yeah. at the moment you know i was being arraigned it was legitimately one of the possibilities and I, my biggest fear was that the system would make an error and i'd be in jail <laughs> but uh you know so so it was stressful you know i was going through all that so i went to the lawyer and he basically broke it down to me he was like no like all they really care about is you're now feeding into the system. You just paid me like three thousand dollars. We were, you know, the system. The system earns. All ship, ships rise with the tide. A yeah. guy like you, who's educated, which is you know euphemistic for white, you know, it's like right. he's like this is not going to really snag you. Um, and it's just amazing how that's just like the function of the system is not what the system actually is. This what the system actually is. Same with politics is is money. Mm-hmm. Nope. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry I like I that analogy my... with uh, traffic stops and shit like that. You're right. It's just feeding into the system. That's all. Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially when you're in situations like uh, when I've been through Arizona, they have cameras everywhere. So like I used to take a lot of trips there because my wife's family would have reunions mm-hmm. and the cameras always got me. Like I couldn't go to Arizona without two weeks later in the mail, there'd be a traffic, t- a traffic ticket, a speeding ticket with my picture on it. Yep. I'm just like all the, it's just a racket. All they're doing is making money. Like I was like exactly. seven miles above the speed limit. It's just like, they're just making a fortune. That's all it is. Yeah. Chicago yeah. does that too. Oh man. You know, yeah. Uh, we don't think you stopped at the stop sign. It's like, I know I did. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'll, fine. I'll pay, I'll pay the yeah, there's no box. debate. Whatever. Right. Right. Just to get you off my back. Right. And it, it yeah. you know, becomes more, same thing with tolls. You know, oh, that's oh my god, what is the purpose? Like, it's yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah. I do not understand why you know, and I've got an eye pass, so I can just buzz right through them and they charge you, you know, just automatically comes on, oh, nice, or, yeah. you know, whatever, yeah. and that's fine, but the roads are still shitty. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's no like, there's no net benefit. It's just like, it's just no. the, the machine is just operating. Yeah. yeah and, and coming from Wisconsin, you know, our roads are pretty decent. I drive into okay. Illinois, and trrr, but I have to uh, go. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, you know, like, a, you know, <clears throat> I, have, I have to pay money to be in my bumper car, basically. Right, right. Yeah. And that's like a metaphor for, you know, infrastructure in general, I think, are. It's like the implication is, well, you know, keep on paying in because maybe it would be worse. Maybe there'd be twice <laughs> as many potholes. Like this, this might be better than you can imagine. If it was any freaking worse, I'd be off-roading. That's why I have a four by four anyway. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeep commercials where they're like, Grr. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's driving funny. in Illinois at times. <laughs> that's really funny. <laughs> but uh anyway so red dennis okay. is uh is politically driven and i assume this guy just you know you said he just breaks off and he just starts killing yeah. people and doing this yeah well he buys some uh, and uh there's a uh uh 
what happens at the end, I don't think is like what anybody's expecting. I tried to like set up all these options and then do the one that nobody thought of. Yeah. But uh, so, but up until that point, like he buys a lot of guns, then you get more insight into his past. Like he was a wrestler in high school. So there was a bit of an expression of a violent streak and like, you know, aggression and so forth. And uh, his coach, uh, there's wrestling coach used to take him hunting. So that was the first time he handled a gun. So he sort of starts uh, reflecting on that time in his life. Then he's Start, buying I'm ammunition. starting to feel a little targeted here. Do you know me? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, oh, oh did, were you a wrestler? Yeah. Oh, cool. I, I never was. Yeah, I totally yeah. made it up. But no. people ask me, they read the book, they're like, uh, did you wrestle? But yeah. Oh, so yeah. Um, that's awesome. So I, own, I, I, I have I, no I, athletic skill whatsoever. I, I own a good amount of guns and I've gone home. Oh, good. Okay. And, oh, shit. Okay. Never mind. Oh, I hear you. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. I'm sorry I keep moving my screen. I hope I'm not driving you crazy. Oh, you're all so, right. Yeah. Okay. I'm not worried about it. Gonna, so, okay. Um, interesting. Yeah. So you're a Second Amendment guy. Yeah. yeah. It's one, one way of putting it. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't think I'm as nuts as a lot of them, but uh, yeah, I yeah, I, I uh, exercise my right. I hear you. Yeah, um, it's so interesting being a journalist because I'm in such a progressive bubble, and I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, yeah. so it's so it's overwhelmingly blue, like 80, 80 some odd percent. Mm -hmm. uh, but because I know a lot of people in the community, I know all the Republicans and Libertarians, right wingers, and like I, I was at somebody's house once, and we were working on a project, and he's pretty progressive liberal and uh he was like but i'm a i'm a 2a liberal and he starts showing me his gun collection he had like machine guns mm -hmm. and all this stuff and uh, it's a, a frame of mind uh, I'm, it really makes me curious obviously i'm putting in i put it in the book and stuff like what is what what is your connection to it like where uh what makes you a gun person uh that i own guns oh. uh, that's it. <laughs> It's simple as that, yeah. Yeah, it's simple yeah. as that. Um, yeah. You know, when I was growing up, I grew up in South Dakota. Okay. And hunting was something that you just did, whether it be pheasants, deer, ducks, geese. Right. Yeah. You know, um, we would go out and, and shoot gophers because they were a pest, you know. Okay. Uh, yeah. You'd run across uh, skunks and fox and everything else. You'd, you'd hunt the fox because they'd uh, raid the chicken coop, you know. Uh, so you, this was from when you were a kid? Right. So Absolutely. your father was your is it your father that taught you? Yeah, how to handle a gun. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and then is also there a mentality? Um, you know, from what I understand, my first exposure to like gun culture, I had a girl I dated in Oklahoma when I was a teenager, so I went and spent time at her house and talking to her father. That this was my it blew my mind because I've never been I've never owned a gun. I'm not used to having guns in the home, etc. I'm like so not in that world. But the way he explained it was. Um, it just all cancels itself out because in his community, you know, everybody has guns. So you're not going to be the fucking moron that doesn't have them. Then right. somebody's going to come to your house and rob you. So it's like, it's just, it's just like all ships rise with that tide. It's just the way it is. Like, does that, is that kind of how that goes? Well, not, or is it more hunting -based? for me? Okay. Um, yeah, I do. I, I haven't gone hunting in years. Okay. My wife hates wild game. Okay. Yeah. You know, and I'd be the only one eating it yeah and which isn't a bad thing but you start to run out of freezer space i hear you we yeah. like to buy a cow every year and stock the freezer up with meat you know nice okay. and gets grass fed you know and, and we can do that out here oh, nice. you know, fairly economically oh and, wow and you know and that's wonderful meat and then you know chickens and and uh you know ducks and stuff like that are, are fine okay. Um, the one thing that stopped me from hunting is that in South Dakota, you hunt a certain way in Wisconsin, you hunt a different way. And I didn't like it as much. Well, what, what, what was the difference? Uh, there's a lot more people out here than there was there. I could, I could oh. look across and it'd be, you know, five miles to the next farmstead. And there weren't that many people yeah. driving around. I didn't have to worry about hitting anything. I didn't really have to oh. worry about anything like that. I could use a high powered rifle and do a real quick, clean kill yeah you know here it's like there might be somebody living you know you really have to understand where you're at and i and oh I, I see okay. and i get that and i'm not saying that uh it, it's not something that i couldn't do it's just that i want to go out and enjoy the outdoors it's an added stress this, you know and so on and so forth but i've always owned guns and i've always had um you know what i what i've needed um, I'm also the type of person, if you tell me not to do something, I'm probably going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, as far as, you know, you should not own this type of gun. Eh, shit. I'll buy a couple of them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell me, tell me again. Why not? 
you know right right that's the whole rad- i mean i'm not saying you're radicalized but that's the whole same human <clears throat> psychology it's like okay if this is supposed to be so taboo let me investigate this and see like see what's what you know there's probably right. something worthwhile about it well it's it's like the uh, ar-15 you know i get that it looks like a military weapon but it's a semi-automatic okay. gun okay and, and sure you can turn it into an automatic gun but i can a lot of other semi-automatics too and I can mm. actually, you know, it's a 223 round, so it's a very small round. Okay. You know, I can make I can make other guns, you know, a shotgun. Right, you know, right. Take a pump action shotgun and modify it a little bit to where you know you hit the pump and it shoots. It hits the pump and it shoots. I can do a hell of a lot more damage with that in a crowd, mm. you know, if you're mm, talking yeah. that way, than right, uh, right, right. Yeah. you know, this little tiny bullet that yeah, if it hits the right spot, it's gonna tumble around and, and do a lot of damage. A shotgun with the with the right shells will do more it's really that's really interesting yeah but there's this uh, hysteria around this semi-automatic well and, and it's media hype and everything else but like you know if yeah. you got just a regular 223 uh semi-automatic rifle um nobody has a problem with that they have a problem with this because it's 5.56 well it's, it's the same bullet oh i hear you okay you how know. often how often do you handle them so you, you're not hunting so i mean and, and not not as much anymore but you collect them so do you do target practice? I do with the uh, handguns. Um, okay. I have not, I, I think it's probably been, <clears throat> oh, let's say six to eight months since I shot a uh, AR. Oh, got it. Okay. <clears throat> you know, and it's, that's nothing that I go out and just shoot. I mean, it's got a, it's got iron sights on it and, you know, one's got a scope on it and it, it's pretty easy. I, mm. you know, I've got, you know, a 3030, a 30 out six, da, 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 you know, a couple of shotguns, a 410, a bunch of 22s, you know, and these are all things wow. that I've collected over the years. You know, I have a single shot 22 that I grew up on. Mm. Uh, same thing with a, a, a bolt action 410, you know, and these are all things that, you know, I just, I don't get rid of them. I just, you know, if I want something else, I buy, you know, another one. Um, it's just part, it's part of the, it's part of your culture. Like, it's just part of where you're from and like what, it's normal to have them around like it's probably not even something you think much about unless the topic is coming up is right. that accurate yeah that that's correct um the handguns yeah. um i uh um i have a need for them oh what's the need uh there are certain places that i go being uh, being an it guy where okay. you're supposed to be armed oh okay got it it's interesting because in california i think the opening i i don't know in detail i'm not an expert but the uh, the the there's no open carry so i think if you travel with a gun like it has to be in your trunk or something like they make it mm-hmm. they inhibit you know too much outright possession of it uh you know the state being so progressive so in your state in wisconsin you're allowed to uh have a gun holstered on you more or less you have open carry which is which is pretty much okay. constitutional and if you want to consider okay. carry then you have to get a uh, license for that oh i see oh and what, what is, i'm sorry this is how ignorant i am but what, what is concealed carry Concealed carry is when you can have a gun in your pocket or a gun got it. hidden. Okay. Uh, open okay. carry is it has to be in plain view of everybody so everybody knows that you oh. have that gun. So in, when you're in an open carry environment, um, so you is it normal to see people with guns like at a store? Not or? really, and I wouldn't okay. ever open carry. Oh, because it's like you're it's like you're looking for trouble. Yeah, you're an what? idiot. No. Okay, yeah. I, I just you know, yeah. and I get it's your constitutional right, but you know, yeah. When people see, and I've seen people walk around town, they're strapping, you know, whatever it is, you know, the first thing I wonder is, do you even know how to shoot the damn thing? Right, right. You know, the second thing I wonder is, um, what would it take for you to pull that? Right. I mean, it suddenly creates an atmosphere of danger. Right. You know, I mean, this isn't the old West, buddy, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, so if you do have to carry, I think that, you know, number one, I think a lot of people will kind of look at at somebody that's open carrying like that and think okay number one he's probably an idiot number two he's probably a hothead number three yeah there's a there's a sense of danger there and everybody's kind of you know and then it's actually and it's actual danger yeah and you might have some people that are vehemently against it and they Mm -hmm. might go over and you know start some shit just because he has a gun oh my god yeah i mean i mean or dumb shit it, it could go the other way too, right? Like, couldn't it be like somebody, you know, 
it's like wants to one up that person. Like absolutely, you know, it, you know, it, like, it changes the dynamic. It's interesting because you know the whole Chekhov thing. Like if there's a gun in the first act, it has to go off in the third. In terms of storytelling, <laughs> yeah. it's yeah. just like it's like human nature. If like if there's a gun in play, if there's a gun on the stage, like suddenly it's a very meaningful factor. Right. So if like you're in an environment, you're in a McDonald's, and there's a guy with a gun on his hip, suddenly that's going to be the focal point of everybody's like energy attention emotion yeah right and in the only yeah. time that i ever feel comfortable is if i see uh you know some sort of indication that they have a badge you know like okay, they're, yeah, that yeah. they're you know they it's official it's official and they're in law enforcement because that's the way they need to wear them okay yeah if you're a private citizen i really think that concealed carry if you're going to carry and you feel the need to carry concealed carry is the way to go that yeah. way you're not causing any problems. Nobody should know that you have the damn thing. Yeah. And, you know, in the event, and I think this is where people get really, um, in my opinion, I think they get fucked up. Okay. Okay. okay? Um, if you're going to carry a gun, it's just like driving a car. You have, to, if you're driving a car, you have to understand that you have something that's hurling at, you know, a certain speed. Yeah. And you have a lot of responsibilities. You can't just slide over and push somebody into the median. You can't just right, run yeah. over pedestrians. Uh, you know, hitting a bike, uh, somebody on a bicycle. Yeah, that's that's bad. You know. Yeah. And you know, you have to watch for motorcycles and all this other kind of stuff. So there's this inherent responsibility with it. Okay. Yeah. And you think about that, and you're trained to think about that from when you get your driver's license. You know, driver's ed and everything else. Blah blah blah. Yeah. Uh, people can typically go out and buy a gun. They get a check as long as they have a clean record, you know, they can get the gun in Wisconsin the same day. Okay. You can walk out of the store a couple hours later with a gun. Okay. Um, and may take you 30 days to go get concealed carry. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to take a class and do this, that, and the other thing. And, and that's fine. But I don't think, um, unless you take the right class, um, you know, I, I hear, and I've gone to a couple of them and one guy, you know, is like, well, you know, if you're being robbed, if you're being this, it's like, I don't even know in my dad and I talked about this, what would it take for you to pull that out? And, and right. realistically yeah. it comes down to, yeah, if you're going to hurt my kids, then yeah, I might. That's yeah, yeah. You know, at least, at least, make sure it's handy. Like it's not necessarily going to go off, but it becomes an option. It becomes an option, you know. So if there's yeah. some uh, immediate danger to uh, to my my family, yeah, I could see that. Okay. Yeah. And uh, but you know, I don't really give a shit if somebody gets robbed. You have insurance, and if you don't, I'm sorry. You know? Right, 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 right. It's <laughs> it's not worth uh, creating a, a a life a life or death. Scenario. No, and, and we've all seen those yeah. stupid videos of people that uh, you know somebody comes in and they're cleaning out a cash register and some guy from the back comes in. Yeah. Yeah. Bullets are flying around. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody got hurt. And you know, they're, they're brought up as a savior, but on the other hand, you watch the way that guy's waving that gun around. How did yeah. nobody get shot? Yeah. You yeah. Know? Yeah. But they didn't it's even know the they're fact. aiming at though. That's the other thing. There's zero. Right. 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 It's just a mess. Um, it's interesting. It's like anything else. Like the car is a really good example. It's like anything like as, as men, we have, you know, advanced upper body strength. You know, that doesn't mean all of us are going to use it to abuse or overtake people. You know, it's like, uh, and there is a, a level, the word that crossed my mind when you talked about concealed carry um, and the utility or wisdom of it is maturity. It's just about, you know, if you have strength, you know, it is, it uh, is just a question of how you apply it, how mature you are with it. Well, you know, it's the same thing. Like, uh, you know, if you're, you know, you've been in a fist fight. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it's usually not, you know, sometimes it is, but I mean, it's usually when you get hit, it's usually not face to face and somebody taking mm -hmm. them. It's usually, you know, kind of a blindside type thing. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I was going to say, it's usually kind of a mess too. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's usually over in like 10 seconds. Right. But I mean, somebody's yeah. getting hit and it's, it's not, it's not coming. It's not coming, right. you know, uh, a Hollywood style where, yeah, you know, cold whatever. cocked. Yeah. Yeah. You're getting cold cocked. It's the same way with a gun. Somebody's not going to stick it and threaten you for 15 minutes while you right give out. a monologue. Yeah, right. You're probably going to yeah. get shot in the back or in the butt, or you know, right. Uh, right, right. It's going to be something that's very quick, and you yeah. won't have time to react. Yeah, you know, more than likely, unless you're a bystander over here and you see mm. what's happening, that that maybe you can stop it. But more than likely, your own self defense is going to not come into play at that point. 
you know you're so right yeah the first fight i ever it's so funny the first fight i ever had i was at camp and i was kind of a quiet kid i was pretty shy i guess it was 15 i guess well this was the first like fight fight like i had, had fights with my friends but in general you know it's like play playing mm -hmm. but there was a kid um i think he was a year or two older he was swinging he didn't mean anything by it but he, he had a golf putter in his hand while we were talking and he was swinging it around and mm -hmm. he meant um i shouldn't give him too much credit it's not like he meant nothing by it but he just meant like i think i had busted his balls and he meant to swipe it by my face like shut the fuck up sort of thing yeah but instead he hit me in the temple right and i don't even think he realized he did like because we were all just talking and yeah. it went boom it hurt you know so I, I saw stars from him. i was like you can't fucking believe he just did that so i got up and i was pretty quiet like nobody was expecting it and he had like moved on. It was like a moment later, but you know, still they're talking, whatever. Yeah. And I was like, you want to hit me in the fucking head? And I just like went all over him, but he told like, I was standing over him. He was sitting and um, it was all like, all the logistics were exactly as you said, like I had a height advantage. He wasn't really cognizant. He wasn't cognizant it could happen physically, nor was he cognizant it would come from me. Yeah. And it was just, and it was a total mess. And it went on for about four seconds and then he apologized. And yeah, but um, it was, it was totally like, there was no way in the world I would have looked him in the eye and be like, are you kidding? Boom. It's just like, I would, you're too exposed. I mean, you're, you're in for a world of uh, potential trouble. Right. That, that's why most of the self-defense people that are truly self-defense people say, you know, awareness is probably your best awareness. And right. You know, just, just having to live the land. Yeah. Yeah. Understand where you're at, who's behind you, who's beside you or whatever. Yeah. And your first thing is probably, you know, grab cover, duck, run, whatever. Because nobody right, right. really wants to get into a gunfight. Right, right, right. Somebody yeah. who has, who really wants to be, ha probably hasn't been shot. Right. And I think, what is your opinion on the media? Not media, well, the media, yes, news and so forth. But also like Hollywood, I think, plays such a role. Not that I, I blame it for, I'm not one of the people that wants censorship. I don't blame, you know, the book I wrote is violent. Like, it's not like I blame stories for violence. But I do think there's such a myth perpetuated by storytelling like i just watched the series sense eight on netflix it's so mm -hmm. full full of gun violence and just shootouts it's awesome but it's like just hearing the way you just describe things it's like completely utterly unrealistic like completely like just like the idea that a gunfight would even sustain for more than a little while is unrealistic um i've only been in fights i've never been in a gunfight so i okay, I, okay. Know, but the, talking to people that have been in gunfights uh yeah. either in the military or even some people that just kind of you know you're walking down the street and it's like boom 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 oh my god you right. know, you duck for cover or whatever and they yeah. see what's happening i mean you know i've talked to people with those experiences and that's and they're people i believe so these are things that i've been have influenced me to my opinion so just so we're clear oh, sure 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 <clears throat> um and no matter where you're at even if it's a planned military thing it's kind of a shit show you know i can only imagine it's probably hard to you know optically and logistically it's hard to probably to see things to know where it's coming from like you said yeah, yeah. but um so i look at movies as entertainment and i yeah. don't see any difference between the high violence and the uh the the made-up type shit that they put into movies and guns then if you were to go back 500 years and write uh epic epic fantasy with swords and witches yeah, they believed yeah. in that kind of stuff, and you know, have multiple books out there, and it's and you're really popular, and and uh, the kids are reading them and everything else, and oh my God, they're taking their swords out and they're they're swatting at trees and doing this and that and everything yeah. else, you know, understanding that you know you probably didn't have the scabbard on your back and you probably didn't pull it out right. like this, you know, right, 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 and all those different things. I don't think it's much different than than writing fiction, you know, it's a it, fantasy, it, yeah, it's a fantasy, it's fiction, and you know, when you're watching something visual from Hollywood, you want that sensational scene. You want the yeah. get blowing up on the sides, all hell's breaking loose. And you want that calm hero just, all right. And, you know, say something yeah. quirky or whatever, or, yeah, I mean, you need those, those, you're building up the tension to where you need that release. Yeah. You, you just took the words out of my mouth. Like it is, it's cathartic. Like, so the emotions have to be heightened. Like mo my favorite show of all time is the, is the Sopranos. Yeah. And I remember uh, as, as first run, I used to like get angry. Like Tony, just being in Tony's orbit made mm -hmm. me angry because he's so angry and it brought right. that side of me out and I'm from Jersey. So I totally had like a feel for the whole thing. And it's just like, I always felt like a little, 
not like I would act out on it or be a dick or anything, but I always felt a little edge of hostility and aggression after watching it. Sure. Because he's just in this sunken, and it's very well realized. Like that show is more more in the realm of realism, but any way you slice it, even if it gets more heightened or enhanced or extreme with fiction, like the idea is to tap into emotions. Like if right. it's Shakespeare, it goes to these real grand, heady, manic sort of states of mind with bloodletting and betrayal and torture and like yeah. but it's you know it's 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 so we can sort of understand ourselves emotionally and it's it's not it's not a literal thing and i also think that you know all these people that protest on what hollywood's putting out mm, yeah i get it you know you you personally don't want violence you personally don't want this yeah but obviously somebody does because they need to make money on these types of films in order to keep yeah. making them so if there's zero interest in this and nobody wants to see it why are they still doing it because they're making money on it it all it's all for it's all drama i mean the, the uh, seed of drama is conflict and the yeah. conflict is going to get violent and uh, it's interesting because i can see it both ways like i can be compassionate and sensitive toward the argument like there was a review i guess uh last year natural born killers turned i guess 25 years old and oh, there was a review kidding. yeah yeah it went kind of fast oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh the uh so there was a review <laughs> where the uh he was like you know look the, it was uh what's his name owen gliberman from variety he was like look i don't believe that movies create violence like and, and nor do i you know quoting him but he was like um, on the other hand, watching something like this and then thinking about all the violence and all movies, all television, this has been going on for decades and generations. You got to stop and wonder if it, if it does lead to a sort of a coarsening of empathy. And I can kind of understand that. I think a lot of kids that go into the military, you know, I, I, like you said before, like, you know, with uh, with handling guns and stuff, everybody has different motives. Yep. I don't think it's like inane to think that a kid might go into the military with jingoistic impulses because, you know, he wants to know what it feels like to kill because he's watched a lot of action movies. Like, I, I think it would be, uh, it, you know, I think you'd have to be kind of crazy to deny that. That said, ultimately, I agree with your sentiment. That doesn't mean you should shut it off so everybody's safe because that's actually a more dangerous world where nothing is being expressed. I, I think I think this world of censorship, and I think mm. it comes from both sides, yeah oh uh, yeah very yeah. dangerous i think it's it's yeah. the dumbest thing you could possibly do if you can't hear you know i i enjoy listening to people that have a different opinion mm -hmm. and whether they're idiots or likewise not, it's it, it's good to hear where they're coming from because then you can understand i mean you that's, can understand I mean, where they're coming from about. yeah i mean you have to and it's interesting i think i mean this is a sort of just a myopic like subjective snobby thing but i think you can tell when somebody, like you said, whether they're an idiot or not, like when somebody just isn't schooled and talking to a lot of people, you can mm -hmm. just sort of feel it. It's just like, well, that's not very persuasive. That's like, you know, that, and also like, you know, if, if you're well read, if you've been around, I mean, uh, your level of comfort with alternative points of view should get pretty high as your life goes on. You shouldn't oh. be like real easily affronted and scandalized because somebody has an alternative point of view. It's like, what are you like, you know, you're, you're just sealed in a bubble. I, I, I think a lot of, I think a lot of people are lost when it comes to philosophy. Okay. And yeah. I think philosophy is, is something that builds over time. You mm -hmm. know, so if you want, if you take somebody and say they're 20 years younger than you and they have mm -hmm. these, you know, wild ideas, whether it be left leaning, right leaning, yeah. whatever, it could, it could be about Bitcoin. It could be, you know, whatever. And he can't, if you can't bring yourself just to listen to what they're saying and, and mm -hmm. kind of, try and understand where they're coming from and how they got there okay maybe it's of no use to you okay then yeah. you, then you can ignore it i mean if it's really dumb but yeah. on the other hand you kind of want to i i shouldn't say you i kind of want to understand what their point is because number one i might learn something number Agreed. two it gives me a a a, a better understanding of where they're coming from so i can have a conversation with them Oh, absolutely. I mean, a few minutes ago, when you said, oh, yeah, are you talking about me? I wrestled, I have guns. I, I'm instantly yeah. curious. I'm like, it's exotic to me. It blows my mind. I, I can't relate to it. But then talking to you about it, it all makes perfect sense. It's all very grounded. Uh, another person that's like, you know, left leaning, I, I think more times than not, but I have a lot of like accrued, like resentment toward my own side. But a lot of times that just leads to, oh, and then you have to move on, you know, because it's yeah. like, well, let's not let's not go near that. 
which is just deadening for the mind. And I, I think you're right, like in terms of philosophy, it's also just the art of living. Like, mm -hmm. you know, people, because of social media, it's just hyper fashionable to prize words over action, but your life is actually a string of actions and actions are unilateral. You can't take an action that means, I mean, your actions can have layers of meanings, but your actions are gonna go in one direction when you make a choice. Right. And you know, the art of living is very important because your actions should be informed by values, character, insight, perception, thoughtfulness. Mm -hmm. So if all of that is, you know, flat and it's just like life is just a, you know, a Twitter flame war, then it's like, then you're, you know, it's just like, you know, it, we're just dealing with garbage consciousness. Um, yeah. I was just going to say um, the way I put it is, and I heard this from somebody else and I, it, I, it stuck with me, but okay. um, your life is basically a sum of your choices. That's it. Yeah. You know, it just kind of boiled it down. I was like, yeah, you're right. So whatever choices you make, if you're going to spend all your time on Twitter flaming people. Yeah. You know, maybe you got to <laughs> go out and go for a hike or something. Calm down. Yeah, you said it. Yeah, yeah. Just ventilate. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, Red Dennis, and I, I just, it's, it's in alignment with a lot of op-eds I write because the thing for the last couple of years has been sort of questioning left-wing orthodoxy in terms of uh, quote unquote wokeness and cancel culture and just, you know, um, uh, just lecturing online and just like how that is not persuasive, how it just leads to more divisiveness, how many blind, I'm also very obsessed with liberal blind spots. So a lot of that goes into Red Dennis and it's a choice. You know, it's a choice to write about that. It's a choice to take that position. It's a choice to even open my mouth about it. And I definitely see, you know, little by little, I become surprised because I guess I'm naive, but I'll see how it will alienate somebody like that's in the same ideological fold as me that's on the left. And somebody's just afraid of it. And somebody yeah. like, um, like I've even had it, I've done like 30 podcasts this year. And it's like, you know, in general, they're great. I mean, I have a blast and I'm talking to all different kinds of people. I've had one or two that were like, either just like just dropped off at the last minute or it was like a no show. And I got to wonder, I'm like, cause it does seem kind of sinister. You look at the cover, not just that it's a horror or thriller story or it's dark, but it actually seems like there's something wrong. It's like, like, it's like alarming. Right. So, um, and then you add the political me too stuff to it. It just becomes so hot button that I can understand somebody being pre-exhausted, A, talking about it, and B, talking about it to me, a guy. Like, so I get it, but I also think it's a shame. And I think uh, I think it's just uh, sad when people are ideologically predictable. It's like, what do you have, a pamphlet on your lap? Like, you just <laughs> you just you know, read the guidelines and just act accordingly. So right. it's just amazing where this is all brought uh, all Hold on this. a minute. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Tell yeah. You, you're a racist, and then <laughs> right, well. right. Got it. Okay. Hang right, on. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're a gun owner, so you're yeah X Y Z. I I can't even say it as a joke because it's so despicable. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's you know, I know a lot of people on both sides, and I'm friends with a lot of people Likewise. on both sides, and, I, and that's one of the best parts of life. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. and and I love the variation of opinions. And yeah. I love talking to people that have different opinions because it educates me. Um, and I love, it. I love talking to people that have the same opinions because they might have a more in-depth understanding of what I think is right versus, mm -hmm. you know, what is actually right. Um, you know, and I think that, that, um, that variety is the spice of life. I really, That's it. and what, what you just expressed actually, and this sounds, this sounds a little hokey, but it's true. What you just expressed is, uh, fundamentally american like that's sort of like the hypnosis we've undergone since we were born like that's the the thrill i mean that's why there is a hollywood here and you know it's like there, there's like a, a machine that creates oh, it's ideas and concepts and scenarios stories characters like it's just like yeah it's just you know there's this idea that we should be in a dialectic a debate a dialogue and um and i think it's ingrained so i think uh, uh, by this uh flip side of that coin it gets aggravating to, to see the sort of programmatic ideological like groupthink and robotic behavior. Cause it's like, no, that's not what this is. That's not what this is all about. Like not only that, but not only can you learn something from somebody that's in opposition to you, but it's also, I think more interesting. Like, I think, mm -hmm. you know, those are your more fun friends. It's like, Oh, I disagree with him about everything. I think he's crazy, but he's fun. Like I, you don't want to sit at dinner and just agree and then high five each other. Right. When yeah. I was, when I was young <clears throat> uh, and we're talking early nineties, I was okay. listening to a radio talk show host who I'm not going to name. Okay. But he's very, very popular and he's very, very conservative and he, okay. he has cancer. Right? Okay. Sure. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. So nobody yeah. knows what I'm over, over my head. Yeah. Yeah. I missed it. I missed it. Yeah. And 
um, I was listening to them while I was driving a forklift, you know, just had, okay. it, it was the only, it was one of two radio stations that you could get okay. like this, this talk show, uh, that was on in the afternoon while you're, you know, yeah. up lumber, lumber and moving it from one pile to yeah. another and then moving it back. Or, um, I could listen to show tunes. And so, oh, I, right. <laughs> you know, right. I mean, okay. I'll listen to him. Okay. Yeah. 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 And no apology, by the way, number one, I think he's reprehensible. And number two, no apology needed for listening to anything. For well, whatever no. reason, I mean, yeah, yeah. No, not that you apologized. To. And there's some things that he said at the time that's like, okay, yeah, I, I get that, and I yeah, understand yeah. that. And the reason I stopped listening to him, um, at that time, now I, I have listened to him afterwards, just because it's, you know, I usually listen to clips because did you hear what yeah. he said? You know. Oh yeah, of course. Thing. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but um, the one thing that he said that that made me shut the radio off and just think for the rest of the afternoon okay is that don't worry about thinking i'll tell you what to think whoa okay now that, 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 that is pretty bad and it was yeah. kind of tongue-in-cheek yeah. but on the other hand okay. it's like that's exactly what he's doing and it's then like a cult leader to cnn where it's become not news now it's commentary oh sure you no know? yeah. and you know so where do you go to get your news nowadays and you can't go to fox you can't go to cnn msnbc yeah I mean, there's a there's a couple other places i like i like c-span because you actually just get to see what's happening it's raw yeah yeah you know and and stuff like that but you know anytime that i feel like i'm being told what to think i shut you off yeah well, well said i mean i just and it's just um i think whenever you're just lectured it's human nature if you have half a brain to just want to mentally just push back against it or reframe you know, in, in accordance with your own individuality. And you're not going to just be like, oh, it's, you know, it's a Louis C.K. joke. Like, uh, you know, and of course, you know, it's very, it's very intuitive and natural to cite him. But he has that, that bit about um, sending somebody an email when you're fighting. He's like, has there ever been anybody in history that read the email and said, oh, right, <laughs> now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change yeah. everything, I think. Like, yeah, you can't, like, mount some well-crafted, like, word missile. It's like, boom. Like, now, right. I mean, really, like, and it sounds quaint, but really all you have is your example. That's all you have. Yep. It's like, that's the thing that speaks louder. It all goes back to action. And, of course, not to undermine, like, you know, what we're doing is awesome. You have a conversation, write a book. All of that is very powerful, but I... You know, if I, I, I read books written by my friends and I, I see it through a totally different lens than I do a book written by a stranger where the only interface is the book, then it might be more persuasive. But it's it's hard to just like willy nilly start persuading. See, I actually and this is this is what I truly believe in my heart. OK. okay? And and is kind of getting back to the writing craft. Um, sure, sure. When you're writing fiction. And whether it's, I don't care what kind of world it is, what it is, when you're talking about building your world and you have your, your opposite polarizing forces yeah. and, you know, good versus evil or, you know, evil versus evil or, or right. whatever it is that you write, <clears throat> um, you're making a statement and you're, what you're really doing is, and especially a futuristic dystopian type, type stuff, okay, yeah. you know, um, but even, you know, epic fantasy or whatever, you're actually making some sort of a statement on what you think a world should look like, right? what it does look like, and what, you know, the opposite ends want. The villain wants this, the hero wants this, and somewhere in between is some utopia that everybody gets along right 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 well said and i think fiction in 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 history has done more to educate people on what not to do mm. than you know uh being a a, a foretelling of what might happen or what, oh interesting what will happen it's, it's so interesting the way you put that I, I really love that like the way i always feel with any work of fiction or work of expression it's there's always a very strong under or overcurrent of values you're always just like you're that's pretty much like if you are a fan of an artist you're pretty much a fan of their values and that doesn't mean ethics or upstanding values or integrity necessarily like one of my favorite uh filmmakers especially growing up but i, I still consider myself a fan is quentin tarantino and those values are very like steeped in vengeance and like you know po postmodern references and being cool and just you know being a badass like it's not it's not particularly um 
in depth, or at least not on every level, or at least not in every one of the films, but it's a value system. It's like, oh yeah, it's cool. It's fucking good music. It's a good groove. You know, it's suddenly violence goes out. Like, you know, it's, it's just, it feels cool. So, you know, or like, it's like the Grateful Dead. Like, oh, I align to this. Like, I want to be a fan. Like, this feels nice. Like, whatever it is, right. whatever they're talking about. Yeah. And it's, um, mm-hmm. and I think you're right that there's more of an education, not ed- educational is a very dry word, but there's more of a, a float when the ideas are sort of coming through, you know, demonstratively. Exactly. The one thing I'll say about Tarantino, yeah, that when you go to his movie, you will be entertained. Oh my God. Yeah. You're <laughs> so right. And also like, he definitely, there's nobody better at like hypnotizing you. Like you'll just sit there. Like you're like following every word. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. And I, um, and I've had like, it's crazy. He's, he's the only one I've been a fan of like right since he broke. Like I was, uh, <laughs> Reservoir Dogs, I was like 14. So I've like actually, unlike somebody like Kubrick or Scorsese, you know, I had to catch up to the earlier things. Tarantino, I've actually followed. So right. I think as a result, I'm a little more critical of him because I feel like he's like a, a distant cousin. So I'm like, <laughs> all right, now he's going in this direction. Now he's, but that's like, that's like part of being a fan. Yeah. Um, but definitely I, entertaining. I just, I think everything that he does um, deserves two looks. You're you're 100 right. Yeah, you know, I think you watch it that first time for the entertainment value, and then you watch it the next time for all the Easter eggs or the hidden. You know, I, I just absolutely. I, it, I mean, there's there's also t- sorts of violence and gore and everything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the entertainment factor, the flash factor, the feeling, you know, part of yeah. it. Yeah, and then it's the script and how he presents things and how he may go completely overboard on something, and really, it's like okay. That's cool. Why'd you do that? You know. Yeah, like, yeah. I think there's a lot more thought that has to be put into his films, other than oh, it's just another blood and guts, whatever. You know? Oh, no question about it. Yeah, and also like really um, astute sense of like motivation, psychology, like and structuring the story, and just it's mm-hmm. ridiculous. I mean, he's brilliant. Yeah. I, I I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. So <laughs> so you uh um uh you have the newspaper. You're also a filmmaker. I am. Yeah. Yeah. I was in LA, you know, it's funny. I, I'm coming on six years up here in the San Francisco Bay area. Yeah. Prior to that, it was 14 in LA. Um, and which is crazy because I'm, I'm, I'm up here, which is a different phase of my life. We like, we now have kids, my wife and I, and it's just like a whole different lifestyle and culture, but I'm, I've almost been here half as long as LA, which is crazy. But while I was down there, I did two features, which were both indies. And, uh, the second one, which is called living things. That's a really good, uh, distributor called cinema libre so it's on amazon prime and the first one did well too it was in a, a rule of three it was in a lot of festivals and it was at like fangoria's festival it was at fantastic fest in austin um and uh, uh fantasia in montreal and it, it was fun like that was a big uh it's it was an exciting part of my life it's become so hard like as of the great recession that market the indie market is just it's really gone like i remember um when i was trying to get distribution for my first film i had above my computer a list i think it was the, the number was 24 i had 24 distributors i had submitted it to mm-hmm. ultimately it got d- distributed by a good company but it was none of the ones on that list i happened to be introduced to somebody and i we were able to work yeah. it out and it was on netflix which was really exciting um but i remember uh, that list was above my computer and i would wait and you know some days rejection would come in or you know then you, you know, or maybe somebody likes it and they're showing it to another executive or whatever Sure. Um, but I kid, I kid you not, all 24 of those indie distribution companies are out of business now. They don't exist oh, anymore. Geez. It's like, it's crazy. It's just like, it's just like, that's my biggest uh, measuring stick. Like, so that market is a shame because that's, you know, talking about Tarantino, that's kind of what we grew up on. Like Tarantino, Kevin Smith, Steven Soderbergh, Cone Brothers, Spike Lee, like mm-hmm. that whole marketplace was a really good moment in time in, in the uh, late 80s, but through the 90s. But it really is, at least from an economic standpoint, it's gone. Um, and so indie film has kind of gone the way of like the poetry slam. Like you just don't, you don't see like a kid take a hundred grand and make a movie on credit cards. And then it, it, you know, catches this, uh, the zeitgeist and it's all over the place. And then, yeah. then there's a studio deal. Like that whole trajectory has been erased, but, um, I was proud to make the movies. I'm actually about hopefully knock on wood with the pandemic. If, if we can all get out of this in one piece, I'm slated to direct, to direct a, uh, a third one, uh, this spring, a horror movie, but oh, the really? budget is like super low. It's, uh, it's uh, it's like ridiculously low because we know the profit factor has been erased. But I have people here in the Bay Area that like we have a team. We have the cameras, the editing equipment, the post production equipment. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna give it a go. So I'm ex- I'm really excited about it. Yeah. You know who surprised the hell out of me? Rob Who's Zombie. That? Oh, oh, really talented. Yeah. Oh yeah. my and god. I mean, it's I, really interesting. Yeah. 
it, it's so interesting because the thing I was saying about quote unquote values, like the, the register you get off his work is like kind of like this shit stain, like really dank, like <laughs> yeah. asshole sort of vibe. But he's really fucking talented. Like he is, the movies are actually really well done. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. I, yeah. When, I mean, I loved his music. I mean, you know, it's all, and his, okay, yeah, yeah. his music's kind of dank or whatever. And then all of a sudden <laughs> yeah, yeah. he's a director and it's like, no shit. Okay. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's he's actually horrible. A, yeah, he's a serious filmmaker. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Another one and another one. It's like, okay, I need to start watching this just to see. Yeah, they really they're really disturbing. Like like <laughs> deeply, deeply unnerving. Yeah. They are, but they yeah. are also deeply awesome. I, mean, I, I agree. No, I happen to agree. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's so funny because when you said his name, for a moment I had like a cognitive dissonance. I forgot that there was music. I was just like, Yeah, the filmmaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's funny that, that that actually happened. Yeah. Burn through the ditches and you know. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it was good. It was good. Yeah. I'll cue one up for you. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, <sighs> um but yeah so that's really cool so the uh, no thank you okay can you can you say the title or is that something you need to hold on to? um you know we don't have one yet okay. yeah we have a premise we're working out i'm hoping to write it in february i'll have time in my schedule to write the screenplay but it's basically um i'll put it this way like the only thing i can say that's not like a spoiler is uh, i'm really um you know all about like you know mental health awareness and that okay. sort of stuff that's part of red dentist too just say whether it's neurosis or psychosis i'm really interested in psychology by way of the arts so there's a big uh it makes it sound un unsexy but there's a big insanity component rather than let's call it say there's a mental health horror movie it's like there's a, a psychosis sort of madness element that i'm really excited to get into that's cool. Um, yeah. So the one thing I'll ask you is, uh, so you said the one movie is Living Things? Yeah, that was the second one, yeah. Okay, the first yeah. one, what's the name of that? You said uh, Rule of Three, yeah, and which isn't in distribution at the moment. It was on Amazon Prime, but they just uh, unindexed it, which they do randomly, but uh, Living Things is still around. Yeah. Okay, well, you know, yeah. if anything, they can look it up on Google. I'm sure they can find it someplace. You got it, yeah. You know, I, I, you know who knows? But yeah. uh, you know, there's got to be a VHS out there someplace. Yeah, definitely, oh, it's out there. It's still on a DVD. <laughs> yeah, and I think I want to actually. This sounds ridiculous. If I had said this even uh, five years ago, I would have been embarrassed. But I'd like to like just give it a home on YouTube because so many people would watch it there. And there's like pretty well known actors in that one, so it's just like it's past the point where it's going to continue turning a profit or anything of that nature. But yeah, at least it would have a stable place where people could access it. You could probably. Yeah, I mean, who owns the rights? Oh, we've got the rights. Yeah, it's just something I have to get around to. Actually, oh, okay. I, I should just put it up there when I have a chance. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. I just want to make sure that uh, I have it so I can throw it in the uh, the show notes. Oh, awesome! Yeah, yeah. Living things is more accessible. Rule of three, though. There's trailers around, so that's you know you just drop a trailer. Uh, thank you. You know, we we yeah. might very well create you know a demand for it. You know, you never know. I mean, yeah, that's I love it. No, thank you so much. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. So, and I'll, I'll also put your paper in there and, and a link to your book and your uh, profile and everything. Oh, uh, thank you. Try so and much. do as much as I possibly can. But, thank you, sir. Uh, um, just out of curiosity, do you have any other books or anything coming out as far as the writing side of it? Besides? No, it's kind of, I'm kind of in a good place where it's like I'm working on the newspaper every day. It's, it's a, a relief in terms of like just turning it off for a while. Yeah. Because um, I, I, 2019, that was the big project. And even though I'm home a lot because of COVID, so I'm sheltering all the time. And it's gonna, it's even worse here in California now. It's gonna go back to like square one in a couple of days. Yeah. Um, I'm not really motivated to do like a big writing project. I've pretty much been uh, promoting this one, just keeping up with the paper. And then the next big push will be that script for that horror movie, uh, cool. uh, Late Winter. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. And cool. I, that's one of the things I I can't imagine how you guys actually do it screenplays, but uh, you know. Oh really? Oh my yeah, it's funny because th to me they're more fun. It's like uh, with prose. I mean, you're in the prose world. It's what? It's usually like 250 words a page. A script is yeah. usually like 100, 150. It's like it's just action and dialogue. So to me, it's like pure pleasure. Like I like I get like real excited. Like hard, it's hard for me to sit still when I'm working on them. Like, whereas with pros, it's like, okay, I'm building the entire thing right here. Like this is, yeah. this is actually the final product. So it's a little more demanding. Hmm. Yeah. That's cool. I wouldn't, uh, yeah. I, I've never done it. So, you know, I, I, I yeah, have yeah. no idea. You know, uh, I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I really enjoy that one. Cool. Um, anything else you want to talk about? No, that's it. I had a lot of fun. I was re it's, uh, it was really awesome. I, I lost track of time completely. It was just at a certain point, I was just like, oh, I'm just here talking to this guy. I, I have so, yeah. no idea. I think we've been on for more than an hour, but you know, that's, that's oh, okay. nice. Okay. Oh, whatever. Cool, cool. Awesome. Um, 
I guess with that, you know, I'm going to tell you, it's been an absolute pleasure. I hope you come back. Thank you. Oh, I'd love to come back anytime. You know, and we can shoot the yeah. shit on whatever's happening. Yeah, uh, seriously, I felt like we were just getting warmed up. I was like, all right, there's like 18 other doors we can step through right here. But absolutely. Yeah, awesome. Thank absolutely. you so much. Yeah. Um, with that, I'm going to say, you know, thank you very much, Eric Shapiro. Um, I will uh, publish all your websites and all, all the links I possibly can for you and plus reference everything that we talked about. Um, upon that, um, anybody who uh, uh, would like to read Red Dennis, it's available on Amazon. Go get it now. Um, and hopefully it, uh, it shakes you up a little bit. But with that, I'm going to say thank you very much for listening. This is Jeff Bacon with the DIY Writer Podcast. Please subscribe to my podcast and also my YouTube channel. And I want you to all have a great day and keep your chin up. Bye-bye. Please hit the subscribe button. I get a bonus for every subscriber and I only need 1,506 more to become a full-time paid employee. Help me please.